Okay, hi guys, my name is Elijah Kellogg. I'm the pastor of Faith Community Church. I've been here once before, and I feel like every time I come now, there's a kid who falls during worship. So maybe I'm just part of the wrong denomination. I don't know. It's getting slain in the spirit. Uh, last last time it was last time it was uh, the the younger kid. Was, he was fine. He's fine. But he, he took a good fall. So, anyways, um, it's good to be back. I'm so happy to be here. Again, I'm from Faith Community Church, not too far from here, and a pastor of student ministries, so I get to work with you guys over there, uh, high schoolers, junior hires, as well as helping out with our outreach programs, different missions that our church is involved with locally. That's my job. As If you remember from last time, I'm also a missionary. Uh, my family and I, we were in uh, Southeast Asia for uh, about five years, we served in a country there uh, that is currently not stable and not safe, and uh, we, we had to leave. However, ministry continues there, and I'm really excited about what God is doing there in spite of the turmoil. Um, I got a question for you guys as we kind of get started, and I'm opening God's word here. Um, what, were you, what, what was happening in the 1100s? Does anyone know? What was going on in 1100 AD? This guy might know. What's up? Okay, what was going on? Okay, that's literally more than I had any idea. That's great. I was literally asking. I have no idea what was happening in the 1100s. This guy seems to know. Uh, if you want to know what's happening in the 1100s AD, come, come hang out with my friend. What's your name? Jameson, go to ask Jameson what was happening 1100 years ago. I mean, uh, 1100 AD, he will tell you. Um, yeah, that sounds about right, though. That sounds about right. I would say, like, Vikings, um, feudal lords were starting to head into the Dark Ages, like the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, before we reach eventually the Enlightenment. Uh, I mean, or I should say the Reformation, and then eventually Renaissance and Enlightenment and on, onward. Um, so, yeah, 11, 1100 AD was 900 years ago, right? Uh, give or take, you know, 20 years. 900 years ago. What if I told you that your story started somewhere 900 years ago? Now you would say, well, yeah, I mean, naturally, a portion of your story starts 900 years ago because you're here, right? So somebody, great, 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 great ancestors back in the day, they were living their lives, and eventually it would lead to where you're at now, which is already crazy to think about. But what if God had a plan for you that began 900 years ago, and then he wrote about you specifically, put your name down, only a couple of hundred years after that, so 700 years ago, God knew that he was going to minister to you, that he was going to use you, that your story was important to him. You know, it's funny, when, when people come to preach, usually we go, uh, pastors usually go out of the Old Testament or they go out of the New Testament and they kind of stay with what they're teaching. Maybe they'll use some cross-references, but today, our story is one of the few stories that begins in the Old Testament and has its fruit in the New Testament. And we're not talking about Jesus, because obviously that's, that's the main story of the Bible, right? Right? If we talked about who the Bible's about, you'd say, well, it's about God. You'd say, well, who's the Bible about? It's about Jesus. But the Bible is also about people. And this story begins 900 years previous before it is resolved. It starts in the Old Testament and it ends in the New. And I'm excited to share it with you guys this morning. So where we're going to start is the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings starting in chapter 10, 1 Kings chapter 10, okay, interesting fact, in Myanmar, this book is called 3 Kings, because Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel are called 1 Kings, 2 Kings, but unless you're not Myanmar, we're in 1 Kings chapter 10, and we meet, uh, we're going to meet an, an interesting individual in a moment, but the story really begins with a King Solomon. Okay, do you guys know King Solomon? Yeah, 
Sure. So you have King Saul, who the people chose. Then you have King David, who God chose. And David leads his life. In his life, David makes a horrific choice of behavior. And he takes from Uriah his wife Bathsheba. He gets Uriah killed. But he keeps Bathsheba. And Bathsheba and him are eventually married, one of his multiple wives. But Bathsheba bears a son, and her son is Solomon. And our story begins with Solomon. Not just in chapter 10 here in 1 Kings, but all of chapters 1 through 9, Solomon is establishing his kingdom. And in doing so, if you know anything about Solomon, we know that Solomon is very, very wise, right? And that that comes from God, that he specifically asked God for wisdom to run the country because when he took it over, he was right around your age. Not yet even probably 20 years old. Very young man, feeling the pressure of the world on him, coming after the King David, the King David, the, the, the Davidic line being this promised line that would reign forever in Israel. Solomon feels a lot of pressure and he asks for wisdom. And man, does God give it to him. God absolutely fills his life with wisdom. And Solomon accomplishes some things that David would have liked to have done, but Solomon is able to accomplish them very early on, even in his kingship. Solomon is a builder, an architect of sorts, and he is interested in building the temple, a permanent residence for the Ark of the Covenant and the worship of the Lord. That takes Solomon seven years to build. And then while he's building that, it takes another 13 years for him to complete his own palace. And basically the, the, the different big building projects and not just his palace, but like food stores and little summer homes and like the walls of Jerusalem and all of these things. Solomon is a builder. He's a wise man. But he's also... A kind of guy that, as we see in scripture, he's just blessed with riches and with favor among the kingdoms. He's a diplomat. And many kings and many people start to come to Solomon to seek his wisdom. Now, we know that all of this is God's plan. But at the time, I don't think those kings in particular really fully saw that. Until we come to chapter 10. And it's actually a queen who's able to articulate what's really happening in Solomon's life here. That it's not just his wisdom, not just his building skills, not just his diplomacy that's giving him all these things. She sees something bigger. She sees something that God wants her to see. And we start in verse one in chapter 10. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels bearing spices and with very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And then when the king of Sheba had seen all of the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he built, the food of his table, the, seats, the seating of his officials, the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord. There was no more breath in her. Can you guys gasp with me? <gasps> All right. That's, I love the Hebrew here. There was no more breath in her. It's like she went on this whirlwind tour of this, of this great king's kingdom and all the things he had made, and she, there's no more breath in her. As the, as the author of Kings will write here, she, she's oh, gasping, wow, this is amazing. You know, and at this moment, she could turn and she could say, you know, Solomon, you're a really good guy. You're a smart guy, a wise guy for doing all this. Good for you, pat on the back. This is all yours, this is all at your hands. But it's funny what, what, what she'll say next. Starting in verse six, down to verse 10. She has something that she responds to this tour. She says this to the king. The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. 
And behold, the half that was told me was not even the full story. Your wisdom and prosperity surpasses the report that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. And then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again, the author kind of notes here, never again came such an abundance of spices as these that, came, that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Okay? Now the queen of Sheba, where is Sheba? Okay? The, the reality is, is we've got to start, our story begins here, this 900 year old story, begins with the queen of Sheba. She comes from a distant land. In fact, Sheba was likely very south, very south, south of Egypt, south of Cush, all the way down to what would be the area, the region of the Horn of Africa, or possibly even portions of the Arabian Peninsula, the very, very bottom, touching the Indian Sea. Sheba comes up a few times in scriptures. Sheba is identified as people who kind of derive from the Cushites. So they're definitely in Africa. Definitely very like kind of Saharan era, like Horn of Africa area. And we recognize that as for the Jewish people throughout history, the Jews would see them as the ends of the earth. So there's a few different times they get referenced and every time they get referenced as a people, it's basically to say the people all the way to the ends of the earth. There's one line where, they, we, where in uh, Psalms it talks about from Tarshish to Sheba. It's this idea of like from everywhere we know, from this end to this end. Now, of course, Jewish maps were much smaller. <laughs> so they're, they're thinking the ends of the earth are not really the full ends of the earth. But in their minds, this would be these people all the way from here, the farthest reach nations, to these people all the way. And Sheba was one of those locations. It was so far south in Africa that it was likely the region of Ethiopia today. So this beautiful black queen from Africa, possibly lower Arabian Peninsula, comes up to see this wisdom of Solomon. She, says, she tells him that she had heard that there was this great king and there was this great nation and that she would like to come and see it. And then when she saw it, she couldn't believe her eyes because it wasn't even half of what she was told. And the thing that she notes in particular is not all the riches. Did you notice that? The thing that she mentions, like why he's such a great king, is not just because the money and all the things. She mentions something very specifically. She says, she says, your men are happy, your people are happy, and your servants are happy, and they continually stand before you and they hear your wisdom. Here's the deal, Sheba, Queen of Sheba, she has gold. She's got spices, she's got riches, she's got a sweet kingdom. She's coming from a very rich place. If she's gonna make a journey that far to pass Egypt, to pass you know, the, the Philistines and Gaza, to, to go all the way up to Jerusalem specifically to see this king, She's got the means, but she realizes something very different in this man's life, Solomon's life. She realizes that the Lord is with him, that God is in this place, that God is in Jerusalem, that God is, has, has favor on Israel, and that's why he made you king. That's why you're here today. That's what she says. She recognizes that God is doing an amazing work in this place, and that's what makes it worthy of her gifts and of her time and of her visit to be there. She knows that the Lord is with Israel. Now this is really powerful because, and, and the author includes this here in 1 Kings to make a certain point, but we'll see in an even bigger, more meta-sized point in just a few moments why this is included in the Bible. But the, but the main point here originally is that the Queen of Sheba has her own kingdom. She has her own local goods, local gods, and she can choose to worship whatever she likes or do whatever she likes. 
But in seeking the truth and her hard questions of life, she goes to Jerusalem and she meets Yahweh, the Lord. You know, it's funny, we live in a world where like, you know, no one really believes in localized gods anymore, localized spirits. But this is an ancient world where at this time, people would have believed like, these are my gods, those are your gods, and when we fight, our gods are fighting, and if I take you over and I defeat you, my gods win and your gods die or run away or go somewhere, but they're not there anymore. My gods are better. These would be localized, specific gods for specific nations. But one of the distinctive factors of Yahweh, the Lord of Israel, was that he was not a local god of the Judaites, that he was not a local god of just the Israelite peoples and who was equal and always kind of at war with the Egyptian gods or with the Greek gods or the Babylonian gods or whatever time period you want to choose. And, she, and the Queen of Sheba realizes this in visiting. She says, this is God, the real God, the only God. This is the Lord who's done this. And she bypasses even the gods of Egypt to get to this place to see the real God of all peoples of all nations. Now what's really cool is before this, while Solomon was building and consecrating the temple in chapter nine, and he prays over the temple, Solomon prayed that foreigners would come from the lands and see the true God of Israel and believe and that God would hear them. So, so Solomon knew the purpose here. The point of Israel's you know, exaltation was to make the name of God great among the nations. That was always the goal. But the Queen of Sheba really fulfills that in coming and paying tribute and witness to that. This is the beginning of our story. But our story actually goes all the way now to the book of Acts. Let's flip over into the New Testament in Acts chapter 8. Okay? Let's go all the way to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts is the book in the New Testament. It's after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And what is amazing is, before we just hop right into Acts, I will say, I don't want to fly too fast past the Gospels because twice, once in Matthew and once in Luke, Jesus will talk about the queen of Sheba. He'll call her the queen of the south. So Jesus will recognize that this queen's visit to Solomon fulfilled God's work among the nations in the Old Testament. And Jesus will actually commend, he will congratulate the queen of Sheba for seeing something that even the Israelites of Jesus' day couldn't see that God is the Lord of all. That even though it was just Solomon, Jesus was greater than Solomon, and, and yet the local peoples couldn't even see that. The Jewish people themselves couldn't even see who was truly God. So, so she comes up again in the, in the Gospels. We don't have time to dive in there, but I do want to come to the chapter 8 in the book of Acts. Now this story starts with another Jewish man. Not Solomon. Solomon's way dead, 900 years later. We come to this point. And we meet a man named Philip. Now, Philip, in the book of Acts, is part of a special group of guys. He is not a part of the apostles. He's not the original, one of the original followers, disciples of Jesus. He was someone that's very close to them, obviously working alongside them, but he's part of the first deacon council. And I think that's important. Let me make an interesting point here, just a side note. Stephen and Philip are not apostles, and yet Stephen is the first martyr, and Philip is the first missionary. While the apostles are still alive, before anything goes out from Jerusalem, the very first martyr is Stephen and the very first missionary is Philip, deacons, not apostles. I think that's pretty cool. That's just a fun, that, that one's for free. The rest I'm charging you for. Um, you don't know that, but at the door I'll take money. I'm just kidding. Um, that one's for free. Philip and Stephen 
are deacons, and yet God is using them for powerful work as a martyr and as a missionary. Philip is first sent to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans begin to receive the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Christ just as the apostles did. That's through the ministry of Philip. But then we come to verse 26. And check this out. This is a very interesting story. We'll break it down as we go. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then Luke notes, this is a desert place. Okay, so so basically at this point, Philip is not in this place. The Spirit of God calls him to go to this place. Hey, I need you to go to the road. Not to Jerusalem, not to the temple, to the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And it's just a deserted place. So he heads to the road. So he rose and went, it says. And then check this out. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. Who wants to be in charge of all the treasure? Me, right here, right? Who wants? Treasure. He's the treasure keeper. He's the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. Now, what's interesting is it's kind of a random place to run into an Ethiopian because we're still in Jerusalem. We're still, I mean, not in Jerusalem. We're in in Judea and we're on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza and Philip's kind of brought there by the spirit and he's kind of probably hanging out and behold, this guy comes cruising by, this Ethiopian guy, black man, probably heading back down to Ethiopia. He's on his way back down. He is a eunuch. And he's a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This is pretty crazy. Candace is not a name of a person. Candace, or Kandak, is the name of the queen of Ethiopia, every queen of Ethiopia. Candace is the Greek rendition of Kandak, which means the queen of Ethiopia. For thousands, not thousands, but likely many hundreds of years, maybe up to a thousand years, the Kandak were led, led the Ethiopians. So the Ethiopians were a society run by queens, not by kings. The highest person in charge of Ethiopia is the Kandak, or in this case, as they say, Candace. Now, What's amazing to that, and it should already begin to you start maybe putting the pieces together here. There was another queen who came from the same region 900 years ago to come up to Jerusalem as well, right? The queen of Sheba. Sheba would have been in about the same region as Ethiopia at this time. So this seems to be a lineage, a heritage, these queens over time. But this guy is not a queen. He's a dude, but he does serve the queen as a eunuch. Now, try to be in my position when I was trying to explain what a eunuch is to our younger classmen. That was not so fun. Um, I kept it really simple. But for you guys, I I can be a bit more upfront. A eunuch is a male who's chosen at a young age to be physically manipulated to not be able to have children. I should say physically mutilated to not have children. But he's still a male, he's strong, he's able to protect the queen, but the king and the people don't have to worry about this guy overtaking the queen and ruining the royal line. Now eunuchs are nowhere in Israel's history as far as you know, God sanctifying that kind of behavior, not at all. But in many other nations, it was a common practice. They wanted to protect the royal family, like a royal guard, but they didn't really want those guys being able to produce babies. So they were chosen at an early age to serve the queen, but also not be able to pretty much have a heritage at all. They were slaves. So this guy's got a really cool job, but he's also basically a slave for life, and he will not have a family. He will not have children he will not have his own inheritance. He gets to play with the queen's money and take care of her her finances, but he himself has no legacy. He is a eunuch. 
And that's what eunuchs are. Now, when we meet this Ethiopian eunuch, a foreign eunuch, what is he doing? We see at the end of verse 27 that, he's com- that he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Okay, stop right there. We should already start to put some pieces together here for our big story. This Ethiopian man had intentionally come to Jerusalem to worship. This man from sub-Saharan Africa and at the very bottom of the Nile, the Horn of Africa, comes up from that region, passes all the gods along the Nile, all throughout Egypt, past the Philistines, past you know, different gods of his choice, and he comes specifically to Jerusalem to worship. And then, get this, he has purchased a scroll of Isaiah for himself, which would be very expensive, right? Not just like print it off the printer, right? It's handwritten. He's got a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and he is reading it. Do you think that scrolls in Ethiopian? No. He bought a Hebrew language scroll that he purchased with his finances after he's worshiped in the house of God in Jerusalem and he is reading Hebrew. And he's studying Hebrew, reading this scroll, seeking God. Now, Put this together here for a second. Just let's pause before we get any farther with our story. How is it that an Ethiopian would know to go to Jerusalem to find the Lord of all creation and then know how to speak Hebrew and read Hebrew and know to purchase a scroll like Isaiah and to worship the Lord and reading God's word? Well, he might know if 900 years ago, an ancient queen of his peoples came and did the same thing. Oh, gasp. And there was no, le- there was no air left in the student. Oh. <laughs> right? It's pretty cool. The connection already is pretty big here. It seems as though there has been a remnant peoples of Ethiopia who are continuing to come to come come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord as they've been instructed now for nearly a thousand years since the time of Queen of Sheba. And here is this guy that Philip is running into, Philip, a disciple of Jesus, is running into, and he's just part of that tradition. Now, let's continue the story for this specific man. In verse 29, it says, And the Spirit, the Spirit of God, said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. So he heard him reading it out loud. Do you think Philip speaks Ethiopian? No, right? But he can hear the Ethiopian reading the Isaiah scroll, and he realizes he's reading Isaiah. So then he asks him, he calls out, and he asks him, Do you understand what you're reading? Probably, definitely not in English. Probably not in Ethiopian. Probably in Hebrew. Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian responds to him in a knowledgeable, you know, in a a language that they share of some kind. And he says, how can I? Unless someone helps me understand. And he invited Philip up to come up and sit with him. So Philip gets up in his chariot and they go cruising down the road. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. It's from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? And then, in verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him all the good news about Jesus. 
So this is amazing. There's a moment here. They're reading Isaiah 53. The Ethiopian's a little confused. Who is he writing about here? This seems really uh, kind of brutal. Is he writing about himself or is he writing about someone else? And Philip, in this moment, opens his mouth and gets to preach the gospel of Jesus, who is the fulfiller of Isaiah 53. And he preaches the gospel. And look what happens. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? That's verse 36. The next verse is 38. You might notice that verse 37 is missing. Verse 37 says that, uh, basically, he says, what prevents me from being baptized? Philip says, you just believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And he says, I do believe. And then we come to 38. 37 was likely a historical addition to the text, and scholars have removed it as though they feel that it might not have been there. Either way, it doesn't matter, because we get to 38, and the, and the Ethiopian commands the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So whether this question was rhetorical or a real question, it doesn't matter. The Ethiopian sees water, he's heard all about Jesus, he believes, he believes so much and so quickly that he's like, hey, there's water right there, should I just get baptized? And they're like, yeah. So they <laughs> hop out of the chariot and they run down to the water and Philip baptizes him. Amazing. And then in verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This eunuch gets baptized, boom, Philip, your job's done. <laughs> the Spirit of God woosters Philip away. The Ethiopian sees him no more, but the Ethiopian eunuch goes on his way rejoicing and worshiping God. What this, is, what this is describing to us, student, is the heart of God for the people, for the nations, not just the Israelites, but for all peoples, foreigners from the farthest reaches of the earth. According to Jewish thought, the Sabaeans, the, 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 like Queen of Sheba, the Sheba region, Kush region, Ethiopian region, whatever you want to call it, it was so far south, it was the end of the world for them. It was the edge of the world. But God had a plan for the people of the edge of the world. God has a plan for all of us people. If you are not Jewish, sitting here today under the teaching of word of God and calling yourself a follower of Jesus, you are like this man, a foreigner, a foreigner who's come before the Lord and the Lord has listened. That's always been God's heart. It's a 900 year old story from the Queen of Sheba to the Queen Candace, her eunuch here. There's a completionist element to this big story of God's heart for the nations. But you know what's crazy is this gets even crazier. This gets even more amazing. Because that man had bought a, a scroll of Isaiah. And he was reading 53 with, with Philip before he got baptized. If he got back into his chariot and he kept reading, he would eventually come to Isaiah 56. Can you join me in Isaiah 56? And we'll close with this. So Isaiah 53, 54, 55, 56, not much longer as he's reading the scroll, which by the way would not have verses or chapters. It would have all just been one big compilation, right? No verses, no numbers, no chapters. He would just be reading it. But for us, it's 56. That eunuch would have got back in the chariot, kept reading Isaiah, and would have come to this passage. Look at this. Starting in verse one, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. And then he says this in verse three, 
Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, "Uh, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. I have no lineage. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name that is better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love him, of the, uh, to, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath, who does not profane it, holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. This man would have got back in his chariot after being baptized and believing in what Philip is sharing with him and got to this point and realized that 700 years before and 900 years back to Queen Sheba, but 700 years here in the book of Isaiah, that God had already written his story. That God had already talked and given him a promise. This eunuch, this foreigner, would have had his mind blown to find himself right here in the scroll that he purchased to worship the Lord. A promise that you have today. Because if he's in verse four, you know, three through five, you're in verse six. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, you're a foreigner. Unless somehow you know you are full blood Jewish, you are a Gentile. You are a foreigner. And long before you ever lived, God had already written your story that you would know Jesus, that you would hear his word. And my prayer for you this morning is that you would obey it and that you would follow him. God had a plan for the Ethiopians. God had a plan for Queen Sheba. God had a plan for this eunuch. God has a plan for you. Your story is written in here. And when you put your trust in him, God continues that story moving forward and begins to create new stories as his gospel goes out among the nations. As John makes, reminds us in the book of Revelation that the people who are gathered worshiping the Lord, it's not just Jewish people in heaven, but a people, a remnant from every tribe every tongue, every language, every nation, every color of skin, every, every people from every part of land, that they are there worshiping Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for big stories, God. We're thankful, Lord, that you saw this eunuch from the beginning of time and you had a plan for him that that story begins all the way with the Queen of Sheba 900 years before this eunuch would be born, that this queen would come and become faithful to you, Jesus, and tell her people about you, God, to go up to Jerusalem and worship the true God of the world, and that this Ethiopian eunuch would go up there and worship you, and then he'd buy this Isaiah scroll, and then in reading Isaiah, he'd find out that it was written about him, God, this is all your plan. And I pray, Lord, for these students, Lord, this morning, God, that you would minister to each of them, reminding them, Lord, that you have a plan for them. You do. You had a plan for me, even when I thought I was worthless, even when I, was, when I thought I had, I had nothing going for me. You had already written my story. And it was a simple matter of just believing, of trusting in you. Lord, to begin the engagement with that story. I'm thankful, Lord, for your ministry to Ethiopians and to these people, but Lord, I'm especially thankful this morning for your ministry to these students here today, these different foreigners and the the worlds that they represent. Jesus, you are calling each of us to you no matter where we come from. 
We're thankful, Lord, for that truth. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.